Andrew van der Stock is going to talk to us. Those of you who don't know Andrew, how many of you know OWASP Top 10? So this guy was behind OWASP Top 10 this year. He compiled it all, and we owe him uh, a lot. And actually, I can talk a lot about Andrew, but I'll actually um, going to hand over the honor of introducing Andrew to another amazing OWASP guy, to Jim Manico. Jim, can you please introduce Andrew? No, 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 no. Hold your applause for Andrew. I, I've known Andrew for over a decade, and before he talks, I, wanna, I want you to understand who Andrew is and what he is to the OWAS Foundation. So Andrew is a unique person. Number one, he's been doing AppSec for well over a decade, one of the most knowledgeable people about application security that I know. Number two, he's a very ethical person. He's always trying to do the right thing for the foundation. That's called our fiduciary duty as a board member. Number three, Unlike myself and some others, he's not a drama queen, right? I'm a drama queen, but Andrew is always about trying to find a peaceful resolution to these conflicts. He's always looking for the right path where everybody wins. And last, he's a very gentle person, but he's also sharp as a razor. Don't mess with him. He's, he's always a couple steps behind me and a lot of other people I know of. Just an all around great person from an ethical, from a how he treats people, his technical competency, and his leadership capacity. All of us in this room are lucky to have Andrew's volunteerism here at the OWASP Foundation. I present to you Andrew Vanderstock. I'll find out what beer you like later. <laughs> Unfortunately, as noted, Ross can't be with us today, and it's really terrible. I actually wanted to meet him. Uh, I missed out on coming to the Cambridge AppSec EU, and I wanted to actually meet him at that point, and I was really looking forward to his keynote today. So um, now, I'm obviously not Ross. I'm also not this person. Um, I am a lot smaller than I used to be. Um, I think the other two have motioned the other parts. I'm a senior director, uh, oh, sorry, I'm a, a director of the OWASP Foundation, and we've just opened up the nominations for uh, the board of directors this year. Please, if you want to, you've got something for the community, you've got something for a project you want to get done, uh, do run for the board. It's been very valuable to me. Uh, it's not easy, but it's really rewarding in terms of experience. I'm also a senior principal consultant at Synopsys. I look after the managed services area, which means that we do lots of pen tests, which when you come to hear the talk, it's going to be fun. Uh, obviously, done a few things. My favorite right now is the application security verification standard. It's close to my heart, and you'll see why. So I think we've got to define what is winning, because if we don't have a definition of winning, we're not going to win, because it's just, you know, it's, it's a task that will never end and it probably will never end. So I personally believe, based upon my experience, I've been doing this since like 1998, um, you know, I really think we haven't pr progressed as much as we could. To my mind, the definition that I want you to think about is building secure software that uses trust and protects their lives, their privacy, and digital self. And I personally believe we have failed miserably. And that is terrible. We could have done something different, but we didn't. And so we're going to look into the reasons why it might have happened that way. But also then, let's look forward to the future. So I called it a future perspective. In Agile, we do retrospectives to see what went well in the last sprint. Well, are we going to look backwards 20 years? We're going to look forwards 20 years. I want to start thinking about these are some very, very big issues that need to be dealt with, we're not going to do it tomorrow. And some of you haven't even thought about doing it yet. And so I want you to actually be challenged. I want you to actually think about what it is that I'm actually asking you to do, which is to stop doing what you're doing. OK? So let's go. Back in the early days of information security, how many people here have got a CS CISSP? OK. I've got a CSSLP. I mistakenly believed I needed another CSSLP to sign me up and get me uh, through. Uh, I'd never met another one. Um, anyway, my bad. <laughs> Back in the early days, you probably have heard of Bell and the Padua and all of those information security um, you know, early giants. But we really haven't had any true giants We've had plenty of people who've done extraordinary things, the Ed Feltons, the Ross Andersons, and you know, 
the folks who've been doing a lot of the on the ground industrial um, information security don't talk to the academics, and I think that's a fail. But there's one person that I think all of you need to know, and it's this gentleman. He actually, this is the first NIST special publication. If you are following the OWASP Top 10 2017, you know that we've picked up 800-63. 800-63 is just the, a continuation of 30, 40 years worth of special publications. This is the first one, literally the first one. It was done in April of 1976. Let's have a look at what they cared about in 1976. I was six years old. It is the OWASP Top 10. Literally, it is the OWASP Top 10. We have incomplete parameter validation. Heard that anywhere? Inconsistent parameter validation. I would actually add missing <laughs> parameter validation. It's still a problem. Uh, implicit sharing of privilege and confidential by That is A2. That's the OWASP Top 10 2017 A2. Um, asynchronous validation and inadequate serialization. You know what? That is A8. This is 1976. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that they were already thinking about threat-based models. They were actually thinking about flaws, classes of users, because they were thinking about the insider threat. They are also thinking about methods and exploitation. And if you look at the way that these guys thought about it, you can see the beginnings of buffer overflows. You can see the beginnings of business logic flaws. And what, did, what happened? Does anyone know what happened straight after this was published? It was classified. <laughs> it was so top secret, they couldn't possibly share it because you'd hacked the United States. So instead of fixing the problem and sharing this knowledge amongst all computer science, no, we'll classify it. No, that's ridiculous. OK, so it was classified for a while. And it got unclassified a little while later, but it was already too late because we'd already started thinking about security in terms of, of adversaries. And that is the wrong approach. We were thinking about ourselves as being different all the way back in 1976. Does anyone know exactly where password rotation came from? I'm going to give you a hint. It's in this table here. And yes, the date is correct, 1979. If you divide 760 hours by 8, anyone want to hazard a guess at how many days that is? Yep, that's 31 days. So originally, they had 30-day password changes because if two graduate students working at nighttime on a single user PDP-8 could crack it in 30 days, surely you could just then go ahead and change it every, sorry, every, in 31 days, you just change it every 30 days, problem solved. The other parts of this paper are great. It actually talks about salting. It actually talks about how to make it slower and actually more difficult to do. It talks about password complexity, which by itself is crap. But anyway, we cannot change our passwords fast enough today to keep up with the scaling that's in this table. So you would have to change your password at least several thousand times every second to match the control that was visible in 1979 on a single user PDP-8 working only at night times and on the weekends. The attackers have never thought like that. They're going, I want a GPU cluster. I will steal someone's credit card and hire Amazon's you know, GPU clusters and crack away. But even now, we don't even need to do that. We actually have people's real passwords. We are missing the academic foundation of our field. And it's because we're industry practitioners. We want to provide feedback for our clients straight away. And we're trying to provide recommendations that are, we believe to be true. But a lot of it's built on this you know, mountain of lies. We haven't got the academic foundations to correctly say what is the actual best answer. As I said before, I started in information security in 1998. Back then, the entire thing was all about firewall rule configurations. We were looking at um, uh, doing hardening. We were doing things like. For example, we were doing configuration reviews of Active Directory to make sure it was hardened for everyone. It, was, it wasn't good. Realistically, 1998 in web app terms was 
do it through a firewall and make sure you use TLS or sorry, SSL v1. And we're still thinking in those terms today. Many of you aren't, I'm glad that's happening, but the reality is here is OWASP. This is the first recorded mirror by the Wayback Machine of the OWASP website. If you look carefully on the left-hand side at the, what became the developer guide, we are still doing that. Every single pen test checklist, and to a certain degree even the ASVS, actually is built exactly like that list, which is just like the resource list from 1976. In fact, they actually mention race conditions, which is still not a part of, um, of the OS top 10 or even of the ASVS. We need to fix that. Um, it is an important element. I mean, the resource folks in 1976 were dealing with mainframes that did batch, literally batch, one thing at a time. It was non-interactive. They were already thinking about race <laughs> conditions at that point. They didn't have multi-processing. They literally were thinking ahead of their time. We still don't think about that, even though things like Node.js is implicitly multi-threaded. Okay, so one of the major frameworks that we deal with pretends to be single-threaded to the programmer, but it's really not single-threaded at all. It's very much multi-threaded. We are being passed by. The reality is if we don't change, our industry will die. Think about, for example, what happened to Yahoo when they got hacked all those times. Think about, for example, how Alex Stamos went there and left within a couple of months. We still don't know the exact reasons why that might have been, but I hazard a guess that he figured out that they were ignoring the information security team, who, by the way, recall themselves even to this day the paranoids. So if anyone from here is from Oath, I'm going to throw you under a bus, and I mean it. You need to stop calling yourself the paranoids. You need to actually work with the developers, and I hope this is actually changing. Um, we don't add any value by sitting to the side. One of the things that I'm actually pointing here is, is that the way that we worked 20 or 30 years ago is very different to the way we work today. Developers are very collaborative. They work as small teams. They talk together all the time. They use pair programming sometimes. Um, they do a lot of work to make sure their software is actually good, but for some values of good. So we need to start thinking about how to do that too. But we've got a huge impediment in the way, and it's us. We are Gordon Ramsay telling people they are an idiot sandwich. Our reports are written in such a way that it implies you did a bad job, your baby's very ugly, and by the way, you can't code yourself out of a wet paper bag, even if your life's dependent upon it. How do you reckon it makes developers feel when they, if, I should say not when, if they get the report? Because what the executive summary says is that your developers are terrible, you should sack them all. You've n we can never, ever build a bridge by reviewing it. We need to build a bridge. And that means we need to actually stop victim blaming. Victim blaming means we have to stop victim blaming developers. We must stop blaming, victim, uh, we must stop blaming uh, QAs, the business, people who take risks. It's their risk to take. We need to inform them of what that risk is, but it's their risk to take. We also need to actually identify why are we blaming users for password failure? We know better. We all know better. If we say, you know, and I see it on Twitter all the time, it's one of the reasons I don't use Twitter very much because, well, drama queens. Um, I should actually tell you that that's the wrong and very sexist thing. Drama llamas. Drama llamas are really annoying and they're killing our industry. If you participate in... Australians, we swear a lot. I'm, I'm going to avoid swearing, but you can actually go S dot 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 posting. If you're doing that, please stop. It doesn't help anyone. We've got to stop victim blaming. If people have had their credentials stolen, it's not because they chose a bad credential. My credentials have been stolen on many occasions. The fact that they're 25 or 32 or 64 character random passwords doesn't make it any nicer for me. It's not my fault. I use two-factor absolutely everywhere. I have literally hundreds of unique passwords. I do it all right, and yet I am still in have I been pawned around eight or nine times. We don't victim blame. If we're victim blaming, we are doing it wrong. Okay? Humans, people, is security. It is not tools. It is not process. It is not, you know, anything like that. We need to actually understand these are real people on the other side. 
and they are not on the other side at all. They are us. Stop using FUD immediately. If your firm markets fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you are part of the problem and why we will never solve this. We must build solutions. We must build bridges. Policies. Policies have utterly failed us. Yes, it gives someone a rock to punish someone else in the future. It's supposed to set the tone and standard. But if you go into almost any large organisation and try to apply each and every one of the things that is in a policy, A, you'd have to find out where it is. It probably is down in the basement, in a locked cupboard, in an abandoned toilet, with a broken light, with a beware of the leopard sign on the front. Because no one looks at them, not even the people who write them. If you really think about how do we actually create policies, it's institutional mistakes that we want to correct for the future. The reality is policies are useless. What do we need instead is guidelines that, uh, you know, aspirational statements. We should be secure. We, our users should trust us. And every single decision is made in those light. You can't comply with every single policy. I was just outside trying to get a photo for this particular uh, presentation, and my work laptop was blocking me get to getting to iCloud. I know a number of other places it won't let me get to, but I can get to other cloud providers. If the idea was to prevent exfiltration, it's not an appropriate control. All it did is slow me down. We work around these things. Human nature is such that if we have to do it the hard way, we will do it the easy way if we can. And that goes through to the way we code apps. So back in the 1980s and in the 1990s to a certain degree, it was the golden age of big design up front, waterfall, desk checks. These are things that have, are part of the bygone age. There are benefits to that approach. However, we don't do them anymore. But our industry is stuck in that age. We are the dinosaur. Okay? We need to start working on why is it that we're not being involved. In this diagram, there is no security. You can deploy an application and then keep on working around and around and around, even though Waterfall is supposedly linear, and not do security. Because if no one knows to put secure requirements in, if no one actually architects it with secure um, design, and if no one codes that, for example, as a user, I should only be able to access my own profile, which is a constraint, that's not going to get built in. And if we're the people who say no, they're not going to come ask. So enterprise architecture is a lost art. How many people still have an enterprise architecture function in, their, in either their clients or within themselves? Yeah. It used to be very close to 100%. And the reason why it was got rid of is it didn't provide value because they couldn't demonstrate value. They have immense value. Being able to say that this is the enterprise SSO function and then validated and improved that and then made it easy to work with and cheap if they'd done that value proposition, enterprise architecture would still be with us. We didn't let, uh, the architects of this world basically thought about themselves in terms of ivory tower. And they're no longer with us. Many of us have been subsumed into other duties and we don't have the responsibility or the authority anymore to make the sort of changes that are necessary. So what happens is we don't have secure requirements, we don't have secure architecture, so we have design flaws. And these are where basically access control and business loss can occur. Those two areas alone represent the vast majority of the breaches over the last couple of years. When you take out passwords, almost all the decent breaches have been in those two phases. There is no secure design. We often do it at the beginning of every sprint. And unless a security person is there helping and building secure software with the team, it won't happen. Sometimes we do code reviews. Sometimes we will do configuration <coughs> reviews. But generally, no. So developers have just got down to code deploy, code deploy, DevOps. We need to divide process, which is agile development, and DevOps, which is culture. Many of our information security policies say you should have segregation of duties. You shouldn't be allowed to publish. Um, if you're the developer, you should not be in production. If you're um, a developer, you should not be able to deploy code. That's absolute rubbish. It's absolutely terrible. And in fact, DevOps ignores that entire policy. So are we better off with the DevOps approach? Well, we're no longer at the table. We don't have a voice anymore. 
So if we want to change the DevOps culture, it's a cultural thing, it's a people thing, and we're never going to get it back. So we have to demonstrate value. You ain't going to need it if you haven't been there. So here we are, we're the information security team, we're sitting by ourselves in a different building or a different country, and we're pen testing away, or laughing to ourselves how bad are our customers, blah, 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 blah. I've been there, it's not good, you know. We've got to stop doing this. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. We need to be there with our clients, building the secure software with them. The, the test patch, test patch, get hacked, test patch, don't fix, hamster wheel of pain has to stop. You would think after, oh, when was the Fred Brooks book come out? The Mythical Man Month came out at least 40 years ago. And it introduced the concept of desk checks. We do desk checks, okay? Don't lie to yourselves. We are external auditors. We do desk checks. The reality is that that process is utterly broken. It's, so hor it's horrible. We've got to stop doing it that way. It does not work. We've had 40 years of failure. It is time to try something very different. Don't be on the hamster wheel of pain. Talking about not being auditors. We are not auditors. How many people here actually have an accounting degree in in, and have specialised in internal audit? Now, anyone. Like literally anyone in an audience of at least 300. Not a one of you. We aren't auditors. Stop calling ourselves auditors. It's not okay. The audit process is to actually ensure that the accountants are doing the internal controls that they do every single day. They are doing reconciliation every single day. They are doing month end every single month. External audit just simply comes through and says, in my professional opinion, these controls are effective or these are the problems. They do it like once every three years. I can guarantee you some of our clients, some of the people that we work for, publish to the internet many times a day. What does it actually mean to do a pen test when the application changes from under you before you even finish doing the initial scan. Our techniques, our tools, our processes are utterly broken. And it starts with, we're not part of the team. We're this other thing over there, which we're not even them. We shouldn't call ourselves auditors because we are not auditors. And just in the same way that I can do in a large multinational's tax return, I shouldn't be doing a large multinational's tax return. And they shouldn't be doing security. But Developers and us, we should have a symbiotic relationship. We need to help doing it. So, the other part of the problem is everybody thinks that someone else is responsible for security. There was one particular JavaScript presentation library that I throw under the bus almost every single time that I do some training. And it's because they won't fix DOM XSS in their product. And I can guarantee the reason why you've never heard of it is it cannot pass a penetration test because that team who builds that product doesn't believe that presentation is responsible for security. They are utterly wrong. Anyone who's here has done React? There's a couple of you. React is awesome. It only has one way to shoot yourself in the foot, and it's called dangerously set in a HTML. That's the only function, unless you go to JavaScript and hurt yourself, that can cause you problems. We have to make sure that everybody thinks that security is their problem in the same way that performance is a problem for everyone. You know, we can't just simply keep on passing the buck, but we can't do that unless we're there. <sighs> I have been in this industry now for 20 years come November, and I have seen all of the fads, uh, and some of them have come around a couple of times, and the current one of fatalistic, you're gonna get hacked, we may as well just accept that. Well, the only thing I know for true is that all software has bugs, okay? All software does have bugs, but you aren't gonna get hacked. I don't think that's actually true. And it's so fatalistic that people actually think, oh, there's no point in investing anything in other than in like detection. But our software can't help with detection because there are no body there saying the requirement is, if there is a problem like someone is busy doing something unusual with input validation or failed logins that we need to log and escalate, <coughs> Well, your application is silent. So intrusion detection is only as good as application security. We need to work on the left-hand side of the equation. I personally believe there is necessary balance. We need to have all parts 
of the application process needs to be defined. There is a place for intrusion detection. There is a place for having incident management and practicing incident management. There is a place for things like security groups in cloud providers. There is a place for TLS. We need those things. Those controls need to be in place. But the fatalistic fads that we've got, you know, back in 2000, it was PKI. Everything was going to be secure because we had PKI. You know, how many people have actually got a client side certificate that's got their own um, identity on it today? You know, it's a huge thing in 2000. It was unusable. The usability of client side certificates is still terrible. Lastly, the thing I'm going to hassle you about is tools. Tools help, right? We've got the equivalence of tools baked into some of the standards, like PCI DSS says that a web application firewall and a source code review are the same. They are not the same. They're two very different things. Tools are getting better. If I had the tools that I have today and had them in 2001, I would be considered a wizard. You know. But the reality is, is that tools need to help us. They're not there as the sole solution. I think Jim mentioned in his talk that you need at least a couple of tools. I'm not sure of the exact phrasing, but essentially we need multiple tools to get to a secure solution. But what tools? I think we need to understand what the tools actually provide us. Not every tool is useful. Not every tool is going to work for us. But if we're getting and detecting things earlier, that's great. But if we have a tool that is not like the other thing, we should stop doing it. So we have to stop with the excuses. I dislike intensely anybody who goes, the world is falling, the sky is coming down, but has no solution other than buy my product, buy my service. We must be done with excuses. And part of this is building us up from basic research into our field all the way through to the way that we address ourselves and the way that we work. So we need solutions. We're done with excuses. No more excuses. We have to dispose of the computer says no. If you're a part of the security team that says, no, uh, 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 you're not going in production, they will stop coming to you to ask whether or not they're going into production. They just will. We need to be thinking about security as a people problem. How do we come to them and say, how can we securely build this together? Back in 2005, I was doing internet uh, security architecture of a corporate internet banking. That platform, if you had $2 billion in the bank and needed to do 40,000 transactions to do payroll, we had to work out how do we do 40,000 transactions <coughs> with a $2 billion bank balance safely on the internet. Previously, <coughs> Clients gave us nine track tapes, which then we loaded on our mainframe and did a batch. That got transferred into secure FTP. The security was that it was on a lease line. It wasn't because it was SFTP. It was because you couldn't get to it unless you're another bank. But yeah, you know, dump this transaction and process it. We need to work with them to actually, how do we securely build this together? That is a different mindset than what we have today. It's got to just work. Uh, when I saw this on Twitter the, uh, last night when I was asking for more memes, I just had to put it in the deck. <laughs> I love memes. I've been using memes for about since 2007. My, my iPhotos is literally chock-a-block with cat memes. Um, I make no apologies. Security has to be transparent. We must make it the easiest possible route. If we are helping frameworks to build secure solutions. For example, React does not have cross-site scripting, you know, unless you choose to use a very dangerous function or go to JavaScript directly. Then anybody who uses React does not have cross-site <coughs> scripting. That's an incredibly powerful message. If you actually say, if you're using Entity Framework and you're paying attention to the, the way that you search for records, you just don't have SQL injection. That's a very powerful message. And it saves time. It means we don't have to test for those things anymore. We can actually move on and actually test for the more valuable things. Let's build secure software. And that, I think, means for OWASP is we need to work with frameworks. We need to help the Spring MVCs. We need to help the Microsofts and others of this world, um, the, the Apache Cordovas. We must help frameworks that other developers build upon to be secure by default and not repeat the mistakes of a Zappi. I, if you don't know, worked on a SAPI for PHP until I realized that PHP is never getting Unicode and it cannot pass Unicode unit tests and therefore it's useless as an input validation mechanism. 
Why were we working on it by ourselves? We needed to work with PHP. The first stage would be for PHP to get Unicode, but then we would work with them to actually help their terrible security story, which is that they don't have a security story. Now, I'm not throwing them under the bus for any particular reason there, because some of the PHP frameworks actually have decent security, but it's in spite of, not because of, PHP. We've got to work with frameworks. We are not special in any way. We have only the same voice as anyone else who's assigned the exact same employment contract as anyone else. The fact that we think that we have more of a say than other people is wrong. We should be basically saying, I'm going to spend my story points on this. And if you can convince other people to come along for the ride, you will get secure software. But if you're just saying, I'm not going to let you go into production until you do it, I'm going to hold your program hostage until you do exactly what I say, that's not OK. That's not for you to decide. Okay? The risk is for the business to accept. And at the end of the day, they can't outsource that risk to you. We need to make sure that when we're making decisions for a, a piece of software, it's because it's early enough in the process it can be just fixed then and there. This picture, by the way, is one of the very few pictures in here that's not common, um, like uh, freely licensed. It actually comes from Code Like a Girl, which is one of the charities that I would heartily imp uh, implore you to follow on Twitter. Um, it's one of the things that's close to my heart. <coughs> PDF reports. We have to, they're a dumpster fire. We have to provide sufficient detail in there for developers to fix it, the audience's senior executives. It's just a dumpster fire. If you'd make it readable by a senior executive, the developers are going, I don't even know what language you're writing in here, but I can't figure it out. What are you saying? Now, we have to work with the developers' tools. We have to use what they use. We have to deliver into vulnerability management platforms. For those of you who do look at Twitter, I said, this is going to give you the feels because you're going, I agree with all of you said, but you haven't given me many solutions. Defect Dojo is one of the most important projects we have here at OWASP today. I would encourage each and every one of you to help it get into, if it's not already flagship, then to get it into flagship status. I hope it is a flagship project. I must admit, I should have looked at that before. Defect Dojo is a vulnerability management platform. There are others. There's Brinker, there's um, ThreadFix, and there is an open source version of ThreadFix. We need to build our solutions, our reporting into those platforms. But even better is if we could actually deliver them directly into the issue registers, into, like, for example, Jira or GitHub or whatever they're using, Bugzilla. We need to make sure that the developers can see what we think is a problem as early as possible. I know from personal experience, people are loath to give up their report until it's perfect, it's polished. But in the meantime, you've got this critical SQL injection which is not being fixed for days, if not weeks, because you know about it, but the developers do not. There is no harm in fixing that straight up. We should be basically saying to people, hey, you've got a SQL injection, how about fixing it? I'll give you a hand, okay? What we do need, though, to replace PDF reports is an executive-friendly um, reporting mechanism. And I don't believe that to be PDF. I don't believe it to be paper. I believe it to be dashboards. It allows people to see vulnerability trends over time. The reason for that is, is that essentially if there's a development team that has actually got a much worse posture than someone else, they need help. If you get an isolated PDF report, you're not going to know that they need help. Unless, of course, in the executive summary, you've managed to somehow slam it into the first few paragraphs, this development team needs help. But if they had a vulnerability trend over time, they will be in a much better shape. So we need to provide the value, the context and the value of the executive audience, and it is not PDF reports. They are a dumpster fire. We should stop doing it. This is the future of pen testing. This is Juice Shop's automatic integration suite that tests every single one of the vulnerabilities in Juice Shop. If you have, if, spoiler alert, you're about to see some of the solutions for Juice Shop's things. So if you're working through Juice Shop, and I heartily re recommend you do, um, this is about to do more penetration tests in around 30 seconds than most pen testers can do an entire day. And it does it every single build. This is the future of penetration testing. We should be basically producing test cases that our developers can build into a CI CD job. 
If you don't believe me, then you are going to get replaced by a small shell script with another pen tester who can write um, unit and integration tests because this can run hundreds of times a day at a speed you just cannot work at, and it gives immediate feedback to the developers whether or not they've resolved a problem. This is the future, and if you haven't quite got it yet, please come back, watch the YouTube video in a few months' time, and understand where I'm coming from. If we don't start thinking about helping developers build secure software, within five years, our clients can get the sort of tools that can do the sort of job you're doing today, okay? At that point, your job is replaceable by a tool. And if Gareth or anyone from Port Swigger is in town, good work. At a certain point, in the same way that we don't do a lot of network pen tests now because our clients can actually uh, do network penetration tests to the level that they're satisfied with using any number of commercial tools and some um, open source ones, web app tools will get there too. This does access control flaws. This does design flaws. This does business logic flaws. Tools will never do that. We still need to use our brains. You've got to code it. We are not auditors. We are helping build secure stuff. If you don't know how to code, how many people here actually code? Wow, that's awesome. Oh, thank you. Oh, I wasn't expecting that high. You guys are well placed because you can actually code the thing that you just saw. End of story. But if you don't know how to code, you need to learn how to code now. Even though it might feel basic to you right now, go to code.org, go to all of the other resources, sign up for Udemy, sign up for Pluralsight, sign up for whatever it is. Attend these conferences, take our training classes, and learn how to code. Pick a language, learn any language. Once you've learnt one, they're usually fairly similar. If you had to pick one today, I would either choose Python or JavaScript, uh, mainly because most pen testing tools are written in Python, and most of our customers and clients use JavaScript. You can still learn Java. There's good reasons to do that. Um, but if you can code unit tests, you're going to find bugs early in the development cycle. If you can code integration tests and automate them, you've got a job for life. It is really that, it, that simple. We need for you to upskill. We need to change our industry completely from being this external auditor, dealing lightning from the mountaintop, to actually applying our skills to building secure software. We have to work with developers. We have to learn from the business. We must work with the business. But most of all, my advice to you is learn from your developers. I love going and dealing with my um, clients and sitting with the development teams because I love learning. I've been doing this for 20 years. I still get surprised by the things I don't know. Any day that I don't learn something is a sad day. Looking forward to the next 20 years. He who thinks cross-site scripting will be solved by 2038. There are some people, yeah, there's a couple of people who think that maybe CSP is the answer, but realistically, unless everyone adopts frameworks that have no uh, cross-site scripting, we are never getting ahead. To me, that's sad. Buffer overflows have been going down. They have been work, like people have actually thought about the bug class and done decent work at an academic level to address the bug class. The Marios and the Gareth Hayes of this world, we need more of them to actually understand how did that happen and what do we need to do to make sure that it doesn't happen for everybody just because? We need to change it so that we have basic academic research into what constitutes a good authentication platform. NIST have done that. If you haven't yet adopted NIST 800-63, please go ahead and do it. It really does address all of the problems um, that exist with passwords. We must build a secure future together. I am absolutely certain we can but we have to do it with our developer friends. And they are friends. They are not our enemies. If you sit in a different place, in a different building, or even in a different country than your developers, you are doing your job wrong. They aren't doing their job wrong. You are doing your job wrong. It may not be possible for you to sit together, but you can do it virtually and remotely. The future is remote work. The reality is, is that if you can be replaced by a remote worker, you can be really replaced by automation. And at that point, you don't have a job. You need to evolve. Everyone needs to evolve. 
please, let's stop doing the things that we were doing in 2001. It wasn't great then, and the evidence shows that it has not worked and continues not to work. Let's stop doing the things that don't work and start doing the things in a fast-fail way. Maybe unit testing with security tests doesn't work. I don't know, but let's try it out. It's got to be better than pen testing. Anyway, with that, thank you. Go change the world. And for a presentation that had zero um, attempts to actually do it before I did it, <laughs> uh, we have time for one or two questions. Okay, everyone, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, before we start with questions, can I just say that uh, two security researchers that Andrew has mentioned is his talk, uh, in his talk, Gareth Hayes and Mario Heydrich are here, and they will be presenting tomorrow. Mario has opening keynote, so please be here before 9 o'clock because Mario is uh, opening uh, tomorrow. And uh, Gareth Hayes is uh, speaking, I think, at uh, 1 o'clock tomorrow. So they're both here. Um, any questions for Andrew? Well, where are we going? We're going to be replaced by robots soon? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for, for this talk. And uh, you touched, I mean, a very important uh, thing about yeah, changing the, the mentality of uh, AppSec people instead of just blaming the developers. And that's, that's very important. But the, also the other thing you mentioned regarding, I mean, working on securing the frameworks themselves and building more secure framework. How do you think, how can we, I mean, move ahead of that, so with, with that approach? How can we work with, uh, with the, I don't know, uh, companies or uh, software companies who are building new frameworks to, to make sure that they are building these frameworks securely? That is actually a really difficult question. I don't know we've solved it yet, but I think we need to reach out to the, the really large frameworks which are struggling, um, and if we can, work as a board member with my board member hat on for a tick. If we can help you or anyone who wants to help a framework get better at security, if we can lend our authority or at least introduce you to the people that we might know, I'd love to be able to help. It's not going to work in every situation. Some folks just don't want help. But if you look at Drupal, for example, they didn't have a security team before version 6, and now they have one and they're doing a great job. So it's entirely possible to help projects with security. But yes. Any more questions? Yeah, there's one here. Hey, um, I had one. So you talk about having a positive relationship with developers mm. and um, non-security uh, folk. How would you deal with those who are always resistant? You give them the information, you give them uh, the advice, and then they still try to argue against those points. A pull request really works wonders. Um, at the end of the day, if they can see that you've actually got some solutions that you want to try out, I've never met a developer who hasn't wanted to at least have a solution being worked on. I worked on a really gnarly CSP problem with a client a few years ago, and we just sat down together for a day and bashed it out. And yes, we spent an entire day working on a CSP bug. But once we actually worked out what was the issue, we understood the issue, and then we were able to apply it to some other apps that they had issues with. It's actually showing them that you're dedicated to not just telling them what to do, but actually finding a solution. I think that's where it comes into, because before they've always had an adversarial um, approach with um, uh, security folks. And often, some clients that I've worked with have actually got KPIs on project managers and application owners that if you have a severe security bug, that's a, bad, that's a bad thing for your Christmas bonus. And that's a negative um, KPI because it means they're going to argue with you until the cows come home, is this actually a security problem? Yeah? So it's on us to actually help our clients understand and you know, our, our partners to understand whether or not these KPIs are appropriate because if they're arguing <coughs> against our advice and we can't provide them a solution because they won't listen, yeah, it's a real big problem. But I think sitting down with them and helping them come up with a solution is really good. There's a question. I am going to the dinner tonight, so feel free to hassle me about board and this at the dinner. Uh, hello? Oh, okay. 
sometimes, well, you have developers that want to do the right thing. They want to write the best applications. You have DevOps that want to do the right thing. They want to de deploy the most secure applications. Yep. You have security consultants and, and specialists that want to do the right thing. But then you have management, which wants to get the product out as soon as fast and spending the less amount of money possible. So my question to you is, do you have any hints dealing with management with, that resists spending more time or more money in a project because it needs to go now and, oh, it's just a security bug. It's not going to stop our deploy. So we're in a transition period, and it will be a transition period where we go from the external view that we're brought in right at the end to actually working throughout. To my mind, it's about budgeting. If we're actually there from the very beginning and helping them build secure software, we won't have that conversation because it won't be necessary. However, right now, we are brought in right at the end. And that's a very negative experience for management. In uh, 2004, I was involved in a project where marketing basically spun up an external team. They literally built an online application for a credit card. But when we demonstrated that we couldn't secure it because, well, and by the way, we found out the day before TV commercials were due to go live that we could actually see everyone's details. We could see and improve the credit card process so we could actually apply as, you know, Ronald McDonald or Hamburglar and get a $10,000 credit card. We could approve that too. They hadn't thought about access control. They hadn't thought about actually data privacy or any of those things. That project got cancelled. You know, there is a penalty for doing it so late. By introducing it earlier, we shouldn't have so many of those conversations. Are we ever going to get away from them all the time? No, we're going to have them from time to time. But if, if we're part of the project budget and we're there from the beginning, yeah. Okay, One minute. OK. Hey, hey Andrew. Um, so one of the talks today was Charles Schmidt from MITRE, and one of the things that he talked about was sort of NIST and mm -hmm. they're using ASCAP for configuration management. As you know, in the OS Top 10, there's a lot of issues with misconfigured systems. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is he would like uh, community feedback, but also if we can take some of the specifications and also build projects to make it easier for people to adopt them, even build them into the middleware mm -hmm. systems as well. Should we reach out to them and have a conversation and see how yeah. we as a board and also as a community could help? Absolutely, and in fact, if there's anyone, a very important thing near to my heart is projects. OWASP is about projects. If you search for OWASP, <laughs> the front page is full of projects. So if you are interested in helping out with these things, and I think in Australia we would call that a Dorothy Dixer, which is a very friendly question that doesn't challenge me. <laughs> um, yeah, we need to work with these standards bodies such as NIST. Um, in fact, CWE, if anyone feels like they need to do some editing, that's an area that CWE needs a lot of help. There's lots of things that are missing. I'm not even terribly sure they have DOM XSS yet. And so we need to understand what additional things we could help external bodies such as PCI, such as NIST, and others. So if you are interested in that, maybe just, what do you reckon, connector? Do it in yeah. the OS connector? Maybe we'll have a chat with NIST and see what we can do and put it into the connector. Okay, thank you. And that was pretty much my time, thank you. <laughs>